he was so rich because his wants were so few. That's what Emerson said about Henry David Thoreau. Thoreau went off to live in the woods. He went for about two years and he didn't do it to necessarily run away or to say screw society. He did it because he wanted to, in my own opinion, learn more about himself, to reflect on the current state of affairs, to reflect on society, to reflect on his countrymen and so on and so forth. He didn't necessarily do it to run away from anyone or anything in particular. Fortunately, he was, I guess you could say, under the tutelage of Emerson. And Emerson had some land, he had about eight acres, and he allowed Thoreau to go there in 1845 and build a cabin where he would live for about two years. Uh, now, a lot of people read Thoreau, and they read Walden, and they say, I didn't understand what the heck this guy was talking about. I can't understand all these references. I can't understand all of this, uh, you know, these hieroglyphics, so to speak. The guy, I can't follow his, his mind. I can't follow his train of thought. So I give up halfway into the book or I read the whole book sort of begrudgingly and I just don't get anything from it. Well, in order to understand Walden, this book, you have to sort of understand the sort of person Thoreau was. This is a person who was real beyond belief. If you were to put Thoreau here in 2013, uh, he would be such an original person that people wouldn't know what to do with him. They'd probably put him in jail. He was a person who had such strong beliefs in himself and in his own powers, his own wisdom, that he didn't sway to the conventional ways of doing things. He, well, he didn't buckle to the status quo. He said, I don't care what you think about me. I don't care about what you think about my way of life. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to live my own life. I won't be subservient to your way of thinking. So Thoreau was many things. He was a naturalist, an ecologist, a poet, philosopher, a social critic, many many things free-spirited person transcendentalist transcendentalist we won't go too much into that but basically transcendentalism is the belief that or the knowing rather that you are powerful that you don't need to give away your power that's the fundamental principles of transcendentalism he lived out in the woods yes but it wasn't a situation where he never came into the town he came back into the town he came, went back to eat with his mom. Uh, he did a lot of walking through the woods and outside the woods, back to the woods. So yes, Thoreau calls himself a hermit in the book and he also says he's not a hermit in the book. But if you read the whole book, you'll see that Thoreau wasn't tied down to any particular label. Uh, the thing about Thoreau is that this is a man who was writing about the dangers of society 160 years ago. He was writing about the preservation of forests 160 years ago. He was writing about the dangers of the ever-growing powerful government that continually seizes power from the people, never gives it back to the people. This is 160 years ago. Thoreau's sentiment was precipitating a storm that was to come a century later, a century and a half later. So this is a seer, Thoreau. He was a, he was a prophet. This is exactly why he wasn't very popular during his time. He lived ahead of his time. So when Thoreau went out to the woods, he built his own cabin and he kept a journal. He was actually writing his first book, from what I could gather most of the time when he was in the cabin he was not necessarily writing Walden when he was there. It seemed to me that he was just making more notes and journal entries about his experience during his first year at Walden but 
I would say the large part, the, the larger part of the book was written in the subsequent years after Thoreau left Walden. Now, why is Thoreau so important of a character? Because at the crux of Thoreau's being, we talk about simplicity. His fundamental tenet is simplicity. Simplify your life. Now, during his time, people weren't thinking along these lines. You know, apart from people like Emerson and, and uh, Whitman and Alcott and, you know, his contemporaries, uh, Margaret Fuller, these sort of people that were in his inner circle, most of the country was complicating things, you know. So America was relatively a uh, new, growing, fast country. Business was on the rise. We're talking industrial revolution here. We're talking train tracks being laid over the land. We're talking about, you know, pre-Civil War. We're talking about acquisition of more territory in the United States and beyond. We're talking about slavery still. We're talking about the Mexican War. We're talking about a lot of chaos and confusion and big industry that was going on during this time. And Thoreau was in the midst of it. But therein lies Thoreau's inner conflict. He did not want to necessarily be a part of all these things. He didn't want to pay his taxes to fund the war. He didn't want to pay his taxes to fund slavery. He did not believe in slavery. He, in fact, helped a lot of slaves uh, reach their way through uh, the woods up until Canada. So Thoreau was living in a time when his ideas and his way of life was not uh, readily accepted. You know, he tried to go and teach. He became a schoolmaster after he graduated Harvard. He went to Harvard at the age of 16, graduated, and became closer with Emerson. And Emerson kind of guided him throughout his life. Uh, he ended up becoming a schoolmaster, but he did not want to beat the children. So. He opted to talk to them, you know, to, to refine their morals, but during that time, the parents of, the, of those children didn't like that. The, they told Thoreau that he had to beat the children. Thoreau and his brother did not want to beat children, so he stopped becoming a schoolmaster. Uh, later on, he would help his father actually innovate a pencil, a uh, graphite pencil, which Thoreau, through his ingenuity, through his genius, actually helped perfect this method of creating a pencil. After that, you know, Thoreau was hailed as a, you know, a powerful person from his father and his friends. They were like, wow, this is amazing. Thoreau stated then that he would never make another pencil again. And he would focus most of his time, if not all of his time, on studying nature. Thoreau was about the age of 28 around that time when he went off to live in Walden. His philosophy was don't complicate your life. Live simply, live in alignment with your own nature regardless of what that is. So if your nature is to go uh, to the mountains and study birds, then you must go and do that wholeheartedly. If your nature is to even kill, Thoreau would say, you must go kill. Though he may not agree with it, he will agree with you pushing forward with your nature. Uh, Thoreau, by his contemporaries, many of them saw genius in him. They said, you know, Thoreau, you're amazing. Why are you wasting your time in the woods? Why are you wasting your time scribbling these notes? Why are you wasting your time studying animals in the forest and, you know, making things out in the woods? And Thoreau would say, you go about your business and I'll go about my business and we'll both live happy lives. People would say, listen, go travel, go see the world. Thoreau said, no, I'm in Concord. You know, Concord had, an, uh, had about a population of 2,000 during Thoreau's time, and Thoreau was happy living where he was in Massachusetts. He enjoyed the land, he enjoyed the forest, he enjoyed the, this, uh, the several ponds of the area, Flint's Pond, I think there was White Pond, Walden Pond, obviously. He enjoyed the landscape. He had no real desire to leave Concord. He, in fact, he loved Concord. Uh, People said, go travel. He said, no, I don't need to. People said, go work business, go become a tradesman. And Thoreau sort of was slightly inspired, so it seems. And, you know, he tried a couple things, selling berries and mulberries, cherries, things like that. But then he always came back to the conclusion that 
I must follow my own genius. My genius leads me to the woods. My genius leads me to the plants and the flowers. My genius leads me to surveying. So Thoreau was not a hermit. He was not a, a, an idle person. You know, he was not all these things that he's scapegoated to be. Some people misinterpret him and say, you know, he hated people. He only loved animals. He was this hermit. He was isolated. No. Thoreau was none of those things. He was just Thoreau. And sure, perhaps, you know, those things were a part of his life, but he can never be defined by any single point. The reason why this book right here, Walden, is the Bible for me, is that no one has ever expressed with such depth, clarity, and poetry how to simply live life in accordance with your own nature. Thoreau said, follow the beat. Follow the beat that your body, that your mind, that your soul produces. Don't follow anyone else's beat. And to further extend that analogy, we could say, look, you know, look at the redwood tree. The redwood tree is the largest tree in the world. It could grow to about 365, 380 feet. It could live to about 2,500 years, maybe sometimes longer. We're talking pre-Christ, some of these trees. It's the largest tree in the world. It's the most durable, fire-resistant tree in the world and it takes the longest to grow. Then look at the bamboo. The bamboo is the fastest growing grass in the world, fastest growing. It grows faster than any other grass. It's a very strong grass. It can, in fact, it could grow up to 100 to 150 feet within two to three months. Here we have the largest tree in the world, the redwood, and it takes the longest. And here we have the strongest and the tallest grass in the world, and it takes the fastest. So, you have your own time. You may per proceed in a very fast manner your life. You know, you may already found your genius, or found your talent, found what your mission is, or you may be more like the Redwood, where it may take time for you to grow and expand and mature. So this whole concept of time, I think Thoreau would agree, it's just uh, it's a nuisance. You keep on doing what you're meant to be doing. And maybe it takes one instance of your life, 60 years, 80 years, but that's just one little blip in the universe. You'll be back to continue your work. This is a person 160 years ago talking about the power of living off the land, talking about how he believes one day we will not necessarily have to eat animals. In fact, eating animals towards Thoreau's uh, latter end of his life became sort of a disgusting habit for him. In fact, he stated that he did not even want to eat animals anymore, but he wouldn't be confined to that label of not eating animals. This is a book that you're going to have to read several times in order to decipher the depth of it. Thoreau writes in a very sporadic, airy, sort of loose prose. His prose are not as tight as Emerson's prose, you know? They're not as calculated, they're not as methodical as Emerson's prose, if you guys are familiar with Emerson as well. Thoreau is more of an aggressive, sort of uh, troublemaker sort of writer, where he doesn't have to adhere to any particular structure in his writing. He may be talking about the forest in one paragraph, then jump to you know, a bar room, sitting in a bar room, or jump to some little kid playing in the pond, or jump to his, you know, something his sister told him five years ago. There isn't a very strict adherence to chronology in Thoreau's writing. He's a poet, but he's taking the liberty to take your mind on this sort of labyrinthial uh, journey through his heart, through his mind, through his own experiences. That's where a lot of people get lost when they read the road. They're saying there's no unifying stitch that's carrying me through chapter to chapter, but think of each chapter as its own essay in and of itself that doesn't necessarily have to adhere to the preceding chapter. That's the genius of Thoreau's book. But as you continue to read Walden, you'll see 
the unifying principle in the entire book is simplicity, is relying on yourself, is generating power from yourself and not giving your power away to these what I call the three P's of authority, your parents, your professors, your priests, your politicians, all these P's of authority. Thoreau wasn't having that. And he was hated for that during his time. Uh, he was also loved by that during his time from some people. Yet now, 150 years later, he's proclaimed as America's, one of America's greatest writers. You see, it takes time, it takes time for what you're doing to take effect and to really uh, flower and blossom. That's why you must continue your path. If Thoreau would have deviated from his path of studying nature, studying the sky, studying ecology, studying the plants, the birds, studying himself, he would not have been able to experience such a masterpiece today. Thoreau wrote something that has never been written before. And I almost feel like I have to become a proponent of this important body of work. Because if you search the internet, if you search YouTube, if you search libraries, you see that Thoreau has been somebody that's sort of been silenced. Even to this day, Thoreau has not become a popular figure. I'm not saying he has to become a popular figure, but what I'm saying is that we continue to silence Thoreau's message because it doesn't align to this current way of super capitalistic thinking, super male dominated thinking, super, uh, you know, annexation of land thinking. It's the sort of book you just have to take your time with. If you take your time with it, then you will be able to slowly but surely uh, gather Thoreau's wisdom little by little. Thoreau wrote this in such a way as not to give you the entire key to the puzzle. I believe he did this intentionally. I believe that he didn't want to just throw everything at you. He could have done that in 30 pages. But he took his time, as he always does with everything, and laid his groundwork methodically, laid his groundwork in such a way to offer and to plant seeds in a way where they will sprout in time within you if you absorb them properly, if you absorb them with patience. This is the sort of book that you have to slow down to read. You can't read it in a fast-paced manner. But once you are able to really read this book several times with the right state of mind of understanding that Thoreau's fundamental principle is simplicity, simplifying your life, simplifying everything that you're doing, having the courage to follow through with your own self, with your own nature, then you will really be enlightened from his work. Now, I'm not necessarily talking about enlightened in the Buddha sort of framework, but enlightened as in this work will light you up. It'll open up your mind. It'll open up and unclog the obscurities that prevent you from seeing reality. Thoreau lived ahead of his time. And I implore you to read this book, to take your time with it, to study it, and to just carry out your life the only way you know how and turn a blind eye to everybody trying to stop you. Because let's face it, most people are trying to stop you from carrying out your mission. Don't let them do that. Thanks guys, this is Dave Monte from Mind Pedals and Circle of Drink. I'll put a link below this video if you want to actually buy this book from Amazon. Thanks a lot, guys. Take it easy. Peace.